While you're turning in your Bible to the book of Proverbs, chapter 28, if you'll write a couple of dates down, uh, December 10th will be our widow's Christmas luncheon. And uh, we are going to treat our widow ladies to a uh, nice lunch. And uh, we are going somewhere better than McDonald's. Amen. And uh, we're going to go tr try to go to maybe the uh, Cracker Barrel or uh, maybe the uh, someone recommended the Silver Bay. Does that sound right? Silver Bay? What's it called? Silver Bay. Silver Bay. Or uh, we've checked on Olive Garden, something like that. And it's always a fun time. And uh, we used to treat our ladies. And I remember one year our church was so poor, we just didn't have the funds to buy dessert that year. And I felt so ashamed. And then the next year I said, if I got to... If I got to sell a child, we're going to get desserts. And, uh, and uh, you know, the, the ladies, they could care less about the food, but they wanted dessert. And, boy, to get that pie or whatever, that uh, chocolate cake a la mode, it was just wonderful. And uh, my kids are like, Dad, you mean they got dessert at that place? I said, they had it that day. I can't account for the days that we were there, but they had dessert that day. And then, uh, so December 10th, and I know some of the ladies may be cautious about getting out, but if you think they would like to, we're going to go at 1130, uh, treat the ladies to a widow's luncheon. And then the next Thursday, December 17th, will be a staff Christmas uh, meal at uh, somewhere. We're still, it's still to be determined. It'll be somewhere great. I remember last year we took our staff to Shane's Rib Shack. Anybody ever read of Shane's Rib Shack? That is a great place. There's one in Powdersville, and I was good to, glad to see that. Proverbs chapter number 28. Are you there? Say amen. Amen. If you're able, would you stand in honor reverence for the reading of God's holy word tonight? Proverbs chapter number 28. And uh, I'm excited about the message tonight. And we'll be preaching on the, the subject of uh, the confession of sin. And we're dealing with prayer tonight again. And uh, look at Proverbs 28, one verse, verse 13. Would you read it together with me? He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth it and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Would you read it again? He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Would you read it one more time a little bit louder? Ready? He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. Hold on. Would you read that part again? He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. One more time. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. Again. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. All right? Let us pray. I want to preach on this thought tonight. It is time to take out the trash. And you'll learn more about that in just a minute. Let us pray. Father, again, we thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for the holy word of God. Truly, Lord, when we try to cover our sins, it just builds up. So, Lord, tonight, I pray that you would help us to take out any trash that is in our lives. Help us and reveal to us any sin that is lingering that might be holding back the blessings of God. Our Father, we still pray for revival in this nation. I pray that somehow you would revive your people. Let revival begin in me and in this church. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. All right, you may be seated. Proverbs 28 and verse 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Have you ever done something wrong or have you ever broken something and you tried to put it back together? Maybe when you was a child, you were running through the house and you were playing and you broke something, maybe a vase. I remember it many times. My brother was five years younger than I and uh, we would race, we would have... Uh, challenges and uh, wrestling matches it's better when you're the one that's bigger and he's younger and uh, but if you ever broke something and tried to put it back up or cover it up it never never lasts well I want you to think about that have you ever prayed for something and all of a sudden when you were praying something came before your eyes that you've done anybody ever had that happen maybe you were praying and you're asking God about something and something you had done in the past had came up before you. I want you to think about some of those things tonight. I want to zero in uh, on one word there in Proverbs 13, and that is the word confess. What does it mean to confess? It means to admit you're wrong. It means to agree with God that you have sinned. You know what it means to sin. Whosoever, uh, whoso, con uh, whoso covereth his sins. 
And you know what sins are. That is things that we have done that are wrong. It is missing the mark. It is breaking God's law. It's going beyond God's commandments. And uh, it is lying, stealing, and cheating and such. I want you to think there's a verse in the New Testament that God's put on my heart this evening as well. It's in 1 Peter 4, 17. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Can I tell you tonight that the only hope that America has is for you and I to get right with God and to have a real heaven sent revival. I don't believe that revival is something that is long gone, but revival could take place in this place tonight. There are some prerequisites to revival. The same, uh, the same, uh, uh, the same ingredients that brought revival in the days gone by are before us tonight. If we're ever going to see a holy move of God, you and I are going to have to take the trash out of our lives. One of the chores that I had growing up as a teenager was taking the trash out. You know, as a young boy, your mother and father begin to assign you with menial tasks like taking the trash out. And uh, she said, now son, the trash comes every, maybe it was Thursday, be sure to get the trash out by Thursday. Guess what? Thursday came and Thursday went and I forgot to take the trash out. Can you imagine what began to smell from the side of the garage? Every time we went by, that trash reminded us you forgot to do what you said you were going to do. Every time my mother and I passed shoulders, I felt our relationship getting colder. And uh, I thought I better do something about what I intended to do. And the very next week, I did get that stinking nasty pile of trash to the curb and thank God it got taken away. There are, there are times in our life when you and I will sin against God, whether we do it involuntarily or we do it voluntarily. And uh, if you're saved, there is a policeman inside of you called the Holy Spirit of God. Every time you sin, the Holy Ghost will say, you shouldn't have done that. That's wrong. You need to get it right. Do you know when the best time to pray and confess your sin is? Uh, not when the Pope comes through in his Pope mobile, uh, not when it's Sunday morning, with the best time to pray and confess your sin is right then and right there. Don't let it pile up. Don't let it be swept under the rug. Don't let it accumulate because you may forget and just like that pile of trash, it will only get worse and the pile and the aggravation will only grow. The best time to confess is right then and right there. And uh, the Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I want to say this to the church tonight. From my house to your house, from the church house to the White House, it is time to get right with God. Can I get a witness right there? America is a nation that is sick with sin. America is a nation that is drowning under the, uh, the immorality of sin and ungodliness. We're living in a time when I never dreamed we would see the legalization of sin. Whoever thought we'd live in a day where little bitty innocent unborn babies would be the target of murder. Whoever thought we'd live in a day where it would be okay for a man to marry another man. That is backwards. That is sick. That's an abomination, let alone a lady. Listen, we need to get back to preaching what is right and what is wrong. It is right to do it God's way. Amen. It's right for a man to marry a woman. It is wrong for a man to marry a man. It's backwards. It's against nature. And uh, listen, the only hope that uh, America has is for the church to get on its knees and to clean the trash and the sin out of our own life. I firmly believe that the church of God is going to have to confess her own sins before we'll see a great moving of God in our country. I want you to think about it tonight. Part of the Lord's prayer he taught his disciples was uh, the confession of sins. You know when Jesus taught the disciples they were amazed. That's where our journey began in prayer. They came to Jesus and they said, Lord teach us to pray. Can you imagine? Have you ever been around somebody that could pray and touch heaven. I mean, they didn't just say, well, Lord, we're just glad to be here. Thank you for another opportunity. But I'm telling you, when the preacher said, let us pray, they could touch heaven. They could pray, and you knew they were interceding and talking with God. The Bible says, but building up yourselves in your most holy faith, 
praying in the Holy Ghost. There is a difference in playing at prayer and praying in the Holy Spirit. I, I remember in Bible college, we dealt with that verse. One of the young men, he was so earnest about serving God. He said, I literally got in my prayer closet and I began to pray and ask God to fill me with the Holy Spirit. He said, you know what happened? It was as if God laid his hand on me and he said, I prayed for five minutes. I prayed for 10 minutes and I began to pray. Listen, we play a lot at prayer. There are some big things that you and I need to pray for. So many of my friends, even C.T. Townsend has said, we need to be praying all day today for the election to turn out right. It is not a hidden thing that there are some misdoings going on in this country. Listen, whoever wins, I'm not going to lose about that much sleep over it because God's still in charge and God's on the one. He's the only one that can straighten it out. So I want you to see some things tonight. I, and uh, I want you to think about the confession of sin. When we're dealing with the confession of sin, it is time to take out the trash in our own lives. I want you to think, first of all, about the confession of prayer. What does it mean to confess? It means to admit you have committed a crime. It means to admit you have sinned. Uh, we've got a policeman in here tonight. A lot of times, I, I've seen it on television, they'll bring in a suspect and they will question them and question them. You know what they're doing? They're striving for a confession. Tell us, did you do it or did you not do it? The reality is you and I are already caught. You and I have already been seen. The all-seeing eyes of God, the all-hearing ears of God have already seen us in our guilt, has already heard us in our crime, and God is waiting on you and I to come clean with Him. I believe with all of my heart this church could see the glory of God. I believe with all of my heart that this church on this mountain in this state could see the power and the glory of God. I believe this is a good church. I really do. I wouldn't have come here. I would have come here if it was a bad church. Listen, God sent me to a bad church. Uh, uh, it was a tough church. I'll put it like that. But I'm going to tell you what. I really see great potential. So many people talk about you. So many people are talking about what God has done here and what God can do here. Listen, I've got preacher friends that have been watching in through you to. Somehow we've got to get this place live stream and somehow we've got to get the gospel out across this nation far and wide before the Lord comes back. I want you to know if you and I would get our hearts fully right with God, there is no telling what God could do here at Blue Ridge View. Here we're talking about the confession of sin. When it comes to, when it comes to sin, you've got two choices. You can cover it up or you can confess it. I want you to think about the covering up of sin. Look at Proverbs 28, 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. That tells me that when they covered up one sin, it led to another. Do you realize what happens when you start sinning and you don't confess it? Your sins begin to pile up. They begin to go under the rug and that rug gets bigger and bigger. I want you to know tonight, God's not interested in us covering our sin. I want you to think about it tonight. He that covereth his sins. Do you remember Adam and Eve in the Bible? You remember what they did when they sinned? They tried to cover up their sin. Can can you imagine Adam and Eve trying to cover up their sin with fig leaves? Uh, I mean, they're covering up. Before they sinned, they walked around naked as a jaybird. I don't understand that. Uh, you and I are guilty. Have you ever thought about this? A little bitty innocent boy or girl, have you ever been over at somebody's house and they get out of the bathtub and they run through the house naked as a jaybird and there's not one ounce of blush or guilt on them? Why? Because they're living in that age of innocency. But Adam and Eve, when they sin, they tried to cover up their sin. Can you imagine? They're trying to get behind the tree. They hear God coming and they're trying to hide. Can you imagine you and I trying to cover our sin? It would be, Brother Taylor, like an elephant trying to put a band-aid and cover up an elephant. You and I cannot cover up our sin. It is impossible. It would take more than a gigantic blue tarp from Home Depot. It would take more than a quilt that is made to cover our sin. It's going to take the blood of Jesus Christ to cover and cleanse our sin. I want you to think about some things tonight. America has covered up sin 
and uh, we have fell for it. Some try to rationalize sin. And they say, well, it's not as bad as their sin. Uh, some try to rationalize it. Well, my sin, it's, it's really not that bad. I mean, it could be worse. Uh, I'm just sneaking around and smoking, you know. And, uh, or maybe my sin, I'm just sneaking around having some social drinking. You know that all drinking alcohol is wrong. Am I in the right place tonight? Listen, he is, we're to be holy and abstain from all appearances of evil. Some of you are a little bit quiet. Would it be okay if I'm sitting at Longhorn and you walk by and I've got a margarita on the table? Why, no. You would say, preacher, you are out of here. You need to get in the altar and you are done, buddy. Would it be okay if you saw Mrs. Jody and uh, she's got a Budweiser on the table there at Chick-fil-A or wherever? And uh, no, no, it wouldn't. It's the same for you and I. Listen, stay away from that alcohol. I've heard too many stories about how alcohol, it destroys, it defiles, and it destroys lives. I want you to see some things tonight. America has covered up murdering innocent babies. America has covered up sin and uh, called it an alternative lifestyle. America has covered up pornography, calling it freedom of speech. How many of you remember the multimillionaire Jeffrey Epstein that was on the news not too long ago? Remember he was that multimillionaire, started out as a school teacher, then he got involved in the banking business and the trade business. And uh, he had at his own island where he began abusing misabusing little girls and he would pay them hundreds and hundreds of dollars. This went on far too long, but I'm going to tell you what, you, be sure your sin will find you out. Jeffrey Epstein had millions and millions of dollars. What he did was ruin the lives of so many, many young people. If the young ladies were in here tonight, I would say that there is no amount of money that is worth your virtue. Listen, God gave you the greatest gift, and that is your virtue, your virginity, to show and to give to your soulmate on that day or that day of matrimony and that there's no amount of money there's no amount of pleasure that is worth forsaking your virtue somebody help me right there you that have young people you ought to preach that to them well Mr. Epstein was called he lived in a I forget how many millions dollars of a uh, uh, of a uh, uh, sky rise condo I have it somewhere he lived in a 77 million dollar townhouse a townhouse at the top of one of the buildings in New York City. But you know what? He got caught. He went to jail. He went to prison. And he wasn't in there very long. You know why? Because his sin as a heavy chain of guilt, it began to lay heavy upon him and he took his life before it got out. But guess what? It's already out. And you cannot sin and get away with it. I'm talking about covering up sin. David tried to cover his sins, but it did not work. In Psalm 32, verse 3 and 4 and 5, David said, when I kept silence, David would go through the motions. Can't you see David? I mean, I mean, if I was a pastor there in Jerusalem and I had David in my congregation, I, I would just like to have said, Brother Clyde, uh, David, would you carry us to the Lord in prayer? Can you imagine, Miss Roberta, how happily and how valiantly and how spiritually David would have prayed, Brother Brandon, and touched heaven? Uh, our Father who art in heaven. Uh, can you imagine David praying? Uh, I mean, he touched heaven and the glory fell. After David's sin, he said, when I kept silent, he's talking about confessing his sin. Uh, listen, when David prayed after he sinned, uh, it was dead as a hammer. It was just as monotone, just as dull, just as uh, lifeless as could be. Uh, and uh, the preacher surely had to look and say, something is wrong with David. David said, when I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long for day and night thy hand was heavy upon me you know what David's describing right there conviction of sin have you ever done something you ever done something bad and you didn't confess it you tried to hide it from God and uh, God already knew and uh, God's hand was heavy David was describing conviction of sin he said for day and night thy hand was heavy upon me my moisture is turned into drought of summer Selah, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgression unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. David tried to hide his sin by keeping silent, but God knew all about it. Achan, you remember Achan in the Bible? Uh, uh, Achan was the man that stole uh, that uh, Babylonian garment and that wedge of gold, uh, and he tried to hide it covered up in his tent. 
Do you know what happened to him? When he took from the spoils that belonged to the Lord, that wedge of gold, that Babylonian garment, and he hid them in his tent, it cost him his life and his family's life. They stoned him to death. I want you to know something this evening. Sin may be very little. Sin may be just very little in your life. Sin is so very little when it begins, but it just it continues to grow and it continues to manipulate. Sin will take you farther than you ever wanted to go and it will keep you longer than you ever wanted to stay. And listen, I'm going to tell you, it is not worth it. A million times, sin is not worth it. Achan, uh, Ananias, and Sapphira, you know what they did in the New Testament? They sold some land and they tried to take some money down and look like Mr. and Mrs. Big Shot and say, you know what, we, we sold some land and we want to give it all to the church. Uh, that's right, Blue Ridge View. We sold that prime piece of real estate and uh, we're just going to give it all to Blue Ridge View. And uh, you know what? They kept back some of the price. She died on the spot. He came in later and said, is it true? And he said, uh, he lied and said, yes, he died on the spot. What if we had offerings like that? When I said, all right, it's time to give a tithe, everybody tithing. And uh, everybody says, well, yes. And uh, those that put a dollar bill in the offering plate, they drop dead. How about that? Listen, it's still right to tithe in the New Testament. You want to be blessed? Be a tither. My, my, my pastor, when he got saved, he said, I want to do anything that that Bible said. And uh, he said he went into this church. There was a big revival. And it said, be a tither. He, he thought it said, be a tither. And he said, I'm going to be a tither, whatever it is. And his wife punched him and said, you goofy head. Uh, that means you're going to tithe and give 10% of your money. He said, Lord, how in the world are we going to give 10% of the little bit of income that we make? But I'm going to tell you this. I've learned to step out on that limb of faith. And I promise you, you give unto God and he'll bless you. I'm not prosperity preaching. But I'm telling you, I have never made a lot of money in my life. But God has blessed Bless that little bit of money that I have and uh, you can't go wrong. Proverbs 28, 13, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper. Dr. F.E. Marsh told a story about copper nails. You ever heard about copper nails? He was preaching revival service there at his own church and he was preaching on the need of confession of sin and restoration, making it right when all possible. After the service, a young man came up and said, Pastor, I am in a mess. You preached about uh, confession of sin, and when you was preaching, God reminded me of some copper nails. The pastor said, I don't understand. He said, well, I'm a boat builder, and I work for the meanest man in town, and uh, he's a boat builder, and he's an infidel. And uh, I've started building my own little boat there in my backyard. And uh, the boats require special nails. They're copper nails. And I've only used a few, but the truth is I have stolen from my employer. And I cannot tell him that I've taken his copper nails because, Dr. Marsh, I've been trying to witness to my employer for a long time. And I've told him this is the week we're having revival at the church and he needed to come hear my pastor preach. And he said, I don't care about your preacher. I don't care about your religion. I don't need your God and I don't need that Bible. You don't say any more about it. He said, if I go to him and confess my sin of stealing his copper nails, he will say what he's been saying all along. You Christians are nothing but hypocrites. Dr. Marsh says, well, you know what the Bible says, he that covereth his sin shall not prosper. You know that word prosper is an interesting word. That word prosper means to advance, to go forward. You'll never go forward in your Christian life if you fail to confess your sin. You will stay right here all the rest of your Christian life. But when you confess it, you can prosper and go forward. Dr. Marsh said several weeks went by and that young man came back and said, Pastor, I've got it right. I went to my employer. I told him that I was very sorry and I needed his forgiveness for stealing from him copper nails. He said, uh, he said, boss, you know how expensive those copper nails are and I've used the excuse that it's just a few copper nails. But the truth is, boss, I took home handfuls daily, handfuls daily. And uh, you see those copper nails, they don't rust when they get put in the salt water. They will hold that vessel together. But I must confess to you, I have stolen. There's no telling how many, but I want to make restitution. I want to ask your forgiveness and I want to make it right. He said, well, what did your employer say? He said, the employer said this. He said, uh, he said, son, I have never 
And he said, George, I've always thought that you were just a hypocrite, but now I know that you are not just a hypocrite, but there must be something to your Christianity. He said, I've never seen a religion that can make a dishonest man honest and also want to make him make it right in restitution. He said, your religion must be a religion worth having. And hopefully that man got saved. Dr. Marsh told that story of Copper Nails in another town. After the service, a young lady came up and she said, Pastor, I must confess, I too am guilty of copper nails. He said, are you a boat builder too? She said, no, I'm not a boat builder, but I'm a book reader and I have stolen books from one of my best friends. She'll loan me a book, I'll never give it back. We always confess, you loan me a book, I'll give it back. Listen, I've had so many books loaned out in the ministry. Pastor, I'll bring it back. I even signed my name in the front so that when you keep it, you'll be convicted. I have the pastor's book in my home in the library. It should be back in my library. Amen. She said, uh, I'm not guilty of copper nails. I am guilty of stealing books. He said, you must make it right. She said, she'll think I'm a hypocrite. He said, you must make it right. A couple of days went by. She came back and she said, Pastor, I went and took every book back to my friend. I confessed my error. And I even said, I'll be glad to buy you the next round of books. Her, her friend said, you know what? There must be something to your religion. I need what you have. Do you know what confessing your sin will do? It will make an impact on others. Dr. Marsh preached that message and uh, he preached it at a high school chapel. He said after the service, many students went to the altar. Even many teachers went to the altar. He said a couple of days later, the principal of that school called and said, Dr. Marsh, you're never going to believe this, but mysteriously all kinds of fountain pens have been reappearing in the front office. They are guilty of copper nails. Are you guilty of copper nails tonight? I'm going to tell you, there was a time when I was guilty of copper nails. I'll tell you in just a minute. That is the covering up of sin. But notice the confession of sin. David, or, or the, the writer of Proverbs said, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. In other words, it's not enough to confess you have sinned. God's word tells us to confess our sin and forsake our sins. Can I say tonight, Blue Ridge View, if the church is ever going to see revival, we're going to have to get the copper nails out of our life. We're going to have to get those books out of our life. We're going to have to take the trash out of our life. Listen, Daniel prayed and confessed. Listen to what Daniel prayed. Daniel prayed and said, I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. You know what fasting is. We know what feasting is. Amen. I'm good at feasting, but what about fasting? Fasting is when you are so desperate for prayer to be answered. When you are so desperate that only God can answer your prayer, you're willing to set aside that bacon, egg, and cheese. Or if you're like me, that sausage, egg, and cheese biscuit. You're willing to forgo them peanut butter crackers for your snack or your breakfast in the morning. You're willing to push aside lunch and say, God, every time my stomach growls, I want to be reminded, God, I need you to answer this prayer. If I was to ask you how many of you have loved ones that are lost and unsaved, saved, I believe every one of us would raise our hand. When's the last time we got burdened? When's the last time that we got so desperate that we said, God, surely we're living in the last days. I want you to know I'm not just pulling sermons out of the air. I'm not dialing in the computer Rolodex. What should I preach on Sunday? The Holy Ghost has got you and I in the book of Matthew chapter number 24. It is the unveiling of the last days and the end of time. You and I are going to step deeper into the uh, great tribulation this Sunday, the Lord willing. We may not make it there. But when's the last time you fasted and prayed and said, God, my so-and-so is lost. I'm begging you, would you quicken them, convict them, and bring them under conversion? That's exactly what we must do if we're going to see them saved. David said, I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer, supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, We have sinned and committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts 
and from thy judgment. That's Daniel 9, verses 3 to 5. You know what David did for his nation? David stood in the gap. He confessed that I have sinned and we have sinned. You know what you and I are going to have to do? We can't say America, you bunch of dirty, rotten, stinking rebels. Uh, no, America is our country. America is where we live. And we're going to have to confess to God we have sinned as a nation in allowing and legalizing sin. Is anybody with me tonight? Listen, it's not just the Democrats or the Republicans' fault. It's not just those in the Supreme Court. God have mercy on those godless individuals that have voted and overturned laws in that Supreme Court. They will stand before the Supreme Judge of all the world one of these days, and fear and trembling will take over their soul. We must stand in the gap. Daniel stood in the gap. He confessed his sins and the sins of his nation. And as Daniel made confession, the answer to his prayer came. When David confessed, I have sinned, God dealt mercy. Turn real quick to Psalm 54. I want you to see this. Uh, Psalm 51. Well, this is a good prayer. I wish I'd have known this prayer as a little boy when I got in trouble so many times and my mama and my daddy they would take me by the hand and do that dance Brother Mark talked about, round and round, and uh, boy, get a good whooping. You, you know there's a difference in a whipping and a whooping. My mother would give me a whipping. My daddy gave me a whooping. You ever, you, you, y'all have parents like that? And uh, we need parents like that today, all you young people, amen? That'll clear up a lot of discrepancies right there. Psalm 51, David said, have mercy upon me. Oh, that I could have went in when the door was shut and said, oh, mama, have mercy on me. Daddy, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Wouldn't that have been a great prayer to pray? David said, Have mercy according to thy loving kindness, according to thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. You see that word, my sin is ever before me? That means David could not get away from the guilt of sin. You ever pray? And you were trying to pray and something that you did a long time ago flashed. I was sitting in summer camp. Right across the way here on uh, Fort Mountain in Dayton, Tennessee at Fort Bluff Camp. One of my favorite evangelists, Steve Piggott, was preaching. Steve Piggott told a story that when he was a senior in high school, he was elected one of the uh, class, uh, uh, class uh, uh, office aides. Him and one other girl sat in the front office daily right after lunch, and their agenda was twofold. Run any messages to the classes or teachers, and number two, to count the quarters that came in for the lunch money and roll them up, give them to the principal to be delivered to the bank. He said he began to tell about the job. They would run errands and then she would run errands. He would take a message, she would take a message. They would sit there with them piles and piles of quarters and they would roll them, count them, roll them, count them, roll them, count them. He said he got his first girlfriend when he was a senior in high school. Steve Piggott is like the rest of us preachers. He's not tall, dark, and handsome. He is tall and uh, he's about as pretty as uh, the average preacher. You know, preachers, they're a dime a dozen. But I want you to think about this. He began to tell about his first girlfriend and he said she was a real beauty I mean a real looker he began to say how in the world did I get her Valentine's Day's coming up and then he had this thought I have no money I'd like to get her something but I have no money he said then a thought like an arrow stuck in his head what if you took a roll of quarters and bought her a gift no one would ever know he said immediately the hair on my neck stood up and I thought I could never do that but the thought came again the next day what if you took a roll of quarters you know a roll of quarters is $10. He said the next day came and that thought came in his mind. You're never going to get her a present. She's going to drop you. You're going to be history. But if you've got a roll of quarters, one roll, they'll never miss it. They'll, nobody will ever know. He said, sure enough, they needed a, a message run down to the end of the hall. He was sitting there. Nobody was in. No, none of the teachers or principals was in the office. Just him and that pile of money. He said, I slipped one roll of quarters in my pocket. Do you know how big a roll of quarters is? Do you know how hard it is to hide a roll of quarters in your pocket? That roll of quarters is jingling around. And uh, at this point, the kids at summer camp, they're cracking up. Steve Pilgrim, uh, Steve Pilgrim, Steve Piggott is tall and he is, he is very lean and skinny. 
He said, do you know how hard it is to walk around without that roll of quarters jingling and moving around and, and try to stand there? And he said, sure enough, I made it through the day. The principal didn't notice and no one else noticed. And I took it home. I went to the store and I bought a gift. He said, at first, my conscience bothered me. He said, but then, after days, it just kind of went away. The kids are laughing at camp. I'm not laughing. I'm beginning to cry. Because the more they laughed and the more he laughed and told that story, God is reminding me of some copper nails. And uh, he said, uh, years later, I got saved and called to preach. He said, I was preaching a meeting in another state and I got down to pray and God reminded me of that roll of quarters. And uh, I tried to dismiss it and the Holy Ghost said, you need to call that principal and make it right. I picked up the phone in the hotel. This is Steve uh, Piggott. I was in the so-and-so class year. I was in the, oh yes, yeah, Steve, how you doing? I'm doing good. What I was calling you about is I need to confess I stole a roll of quarters. And I want to pay that back and I want to pay it double. He said, I'm not interested in your money. I'm so glad God saved you and God's called you to preach. What I need you to do is I need you to come back to this high school and we're going to have a pep rally and I want you to tell everybody that story that you just told me and how that God's working in your heart. He said, I'd rather just give you 10 plus $10 and be done with it. He said, no, Steve, I believe God would have you to be a testimony. Steve Piggott paid his own fare, went back to that high school and on both sides of that gym floor, he preached to nearly 800 or maybe 1,000 people. He gave that illustration and he told how God had changed his life scores of teenagers came to Christ that morning and were saved. But beyond that, scores came and they confessed that they had done wrong. You know what? You and I have some quarters in our lives. After the service was over, they laughed. Steve, Pil I'm going to get him here one day. Steve Pilgrim is one of the funniest, greatest, powerful preachers. You ought to just Google him on the internet. He is great. Steve Piggott. And uh, he'll be here one of these days. But you know what? After the service, we went out to Fort Bluff. It's a, a secured place, but I mean it is overlooking a bluff. The kids were still laughing. Whoa, what a story. Them quarters, I mean they're laughing. And I'm trying to give an afterglow discussion, and I broke in tears. What's wrong, Brother Brian? What's wrong? I've got a group of middle schoolers sitting before me, and they're laughing, still laughing. And I said, I have to confess. While Brother Steve was preaching about his quarters, God reminded me of something I must take care of. What did you do? I said, I'm not saying. I've got to get it right. I took those kids home on Friday. On Sunday, I made it right. I went to church. After church, we were headed to lunch, but I told my family, I said, we're going to go make something right. You see, as a little boy, my cousin and I were up to no good. We got in trouble. You're all dying to know what I did, didn't you? You come back next Wednesday and I'll tell you. Listen. My cousin and I, he was the mischievous thing, I'm telling you, and he brought me in with him, just a simpleton. And uh, we would walk down to the Magic Market gas station. It was about a half a mile from his house there in Powder Springs, Georgia. We would go down there and we'd buy candy or get a Coke. One day, he came up with the ingenious idea, we need to try smoking. You ever been through that as yet? We need to try smoking. And we're not only going to try smoking, we're going to get us some Swisher Sweet cigars. You ever see them they come in a little box about like that? And the plan was, when we go in, I'm going to talk to the man, you know, the Indian man from India, and I'm going to distract him, and I'm just going to run interference, and my cousin, he is going to slip them in his pants. We're out of there, we're going to try, and uh, we're just going to see how it goes. When we get there, Brother Bearden, the plan changed. All of a sudden, he's going to run interference and I'm going to steal the cigars. I'm like, wait, wake us up. Here we go. He opens the door, the bell's jingling, and uh, we're walking around. Had to look like the most guilty thug suspects in all your life. Sure enough, he runs interference. I go over there, mess around, and I pick him up, put him in my pants, and man, we're out the door. Nobody saw us. Not a thing. We went home, and you know what? We lit those cigars. And you know, they got that little filter on there. I mean, we put them up, and I'm like, I can't do it. He couldn't do it either. You know what we end up doing? We end up throwing them things away and uh, we never thought about it again until years later at summer camp. I told my family, I said, we've got to go on a little side trip. I've got to make something right. You remember the quarters the preacher preached about? I've got some quarters I need to take care of. And they said, what is it, Dad? I told them the story. I stole cigars and I've got to go make it right. They said, we're not going to jail for you, Dad. You can go to jail. It is on you, Dad. Listen, we had a little blue minivan 
And when I pulled up, I thought, I'm going to be real super spiritual. You know, you know these preachers, they, gotta be, they just got to show off. And I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm taking my kids in and my wife, and I'm going to prove to them what you do when you sin. You confess it and you make restitution. And when I pulled up, they said, Dad, we're not going to jail with you. Forget it. I said, listen, I'm older than you. Come on, honey. She said, honey, it's on you. If somebody's got to get you out of jail, it's me. I'm staying. I'm not going in. My, my three kids walk in with me. It is now the Texaco. It's not the magic market. It is traded hands. I walk up to the desk. I said, sir, I need to confess something. He said, confess? Did you do a crime? I said, yes, I did. About 25 years ago, I came in here when it was the magic market. This place was a magic market. He's a young teenager. I said, it was, believe it or not, probably before you were born. I did something so bad. I stole some Swisher Sweet cigars and I want to confess it, and I want to pay for them. You mean you want to buy them? No, I don't want to buy them. I want to pay for them. He put them on the counter, handed them to me. I said, no, sir, I don't want them. I want to pay for a pack. Is your manager here or the owner? Well, he lives out of the country. I said, well, would you make a note that this preacher came in and confessed? He stole the cigars, and he paid for it. He said, that's the strangest thing I've ever heard. I paid for them, and he handed them to me. I said, sir, I don't want them. He said, wait a minute, you're paying for them, but you don't want them. I said, no, I'm paying for the ones that I stole because God will not let me get it out of my mind, and I need to get it right. He said, it's the strangest thing I've ever heard. I left him a gospel track, and when we got back in the minivan, my kid said, Dad, I hope you learned your lesson. Don't you ever do that again. I said, I'll try not to, amen. And uh, to this day, I've not stolen another pack of cigars. What are you saying, preacher? He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. You know what it's time to do tonight? It's time to take out the trash in our own life. Maybe while I was preaching, God reminded you of some copper nails. Maybe God reminded you of some roll of quarters or maybe some swisher sweets. I don't know what it is, but I promise you, every one of us have something that is hidden somewhere that when we pray, God says, make it right. If I was not right with my brother, I would make it right. My pastor told about stealing a watermelon, and years later, he had to go back and make it right. You ever done something? Tried to hide it? You can't hide it. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh shall have mercy. Let us pray. Our Father, tonight, we sure do thank you that there is a Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. And our Father, we are far from perfect individuals. We have no excuse to sin. But Father, I'm glad that when we do sin, we do reap the consequences of guilt. And Father, thank you for that. I pray tonight for those that are under the sound of my voice, those that will listen by way of the internet. My Father, the greatest lesson that a Christian can learn is to confess their sins immediately and forsake them. And so, Lord, tonight, while I'm praying, I pray that you're showing someone maybe some little sin, maybe some big sin that they need to get right. Maybe some act, maybe some deed, maybe some words that they've said, and they need to confess it and make it right. Our Father, we sure do need revival. So I pray in this moment of invitation, would you speak to hearts? And I pray that even right now, confession is being made. That they're not only going to confess sin, but Lord, we'll all forsake that sin. We'll walk away from it. Father, bless this time of invitation.